Well, today we're going to be with uh, Justin Ratner. He's going to be the president of Dover Tubular Alloys, and we're going to talk about the welded uh, domestic welded tube market and how the effects of seamless import stainless even affect that market. Supply chain from the global perspective of the manufacturers to the demand side as well. Um, and with that, I guess I'll just turn it over to Justin and we'll, oh, let me give a little housekeeping notes here too. I believe in the chat sections here, you can chat all you want. Uh, we'll try to save the questions until the end if we can. So Justin can get through the information and then we can open it up to questions after that, but you can post them and I'll kind of watch it as we go along. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Justin. Beautiful, thanks, Jim. So before we get started with everything, uh, I'm Justin Ratner. I'm the president of Dover Tubular Alloys. We are a master distributor of stainless steel tubing and aluminum tubing and pipe, selling exclusively to distributors, uh, wholesalers, and other metal service centers. Also, um, I was just scrolling through the attendee list a little bit. I just kind of want to take a second and to acknowledge a couple of things. It looks like we have two management team members of publicly traded companies on board with us. It looks like we have representatives from multiple seamless domestic mills and procurement team members from many of the largest distributors. So I wanted to just say thank you, right? Thanks for putting your trust in our company and uh, thank you for allowing me to help you guys navigate these, these rough waters at this time. So one other thing, right? Uh, every other presentation that I've seen uh, on supply chain management has really been data heavy, right? It's been charts, it's been numbers, everything. Today, I wanted to take a more relaxed format and kind of take a, more of a narrative approach to everything and walk you guys through what's happening and where we're going. So today we're gonna cover two major markets, right? Stainless welded tube and stainless seamless tube. We're gonna talk about the supply shocks that have hit them. And we're gonna talk about the impacts to both supply security and pricing in both of those subsets. Well, Justin, that sounds like a lot of uh, good information to talk about here today. So tell me a little bit about how the supply shock and the welded tubing began. Fair enough, right? So understand the issue, right? You first need to understand how the welded tube market works. First, in the ideal world, right? Lead times for welded domestic tubing were about eight to 10 weeks. Pricing was near parity with import unless you were buying large project quantities. So it was an efficient market where there were quick deliveries, there were efficient pricing mechanisms, right? Now, from a supply chain perspective, welded tube is produced using stainless steel coil strip or plate, right? And upstream from these domestic suppliers are three major players. You have ATI, NAS, and Autocompu, right? So everything started way back in December when ATI said that they were gonna be announcing that they are exiting the 300 series strip market. Right at that point in time, what we saw happen was downstream pricing started to rise as buyers in the United States, whether they were the major stockists, major distributors or end users started buying heavy, I mean, real heavy in anticipation of substantial price increases in 2021. So their thought process was, hey, one of the largest strip mills in the United States is exiting. Prices can only go higher next year. Let's get ahead of this now and buy as much as we can. But beneath the surface, nobody was really thinking about supply security during that first quarter. We were in a rising price environment. Demand was going up, but they weren't concerned about any potential issues with the supply chain. Man, a lot of stuff was happening at that time, I guess. Can you tell me a little bit about what, um, what has triggered the events for the shortages? Yeah, so just again, painting a little extra context, right? Demand was surging at the welded mills, right? There was base price increase after base price increase. Surcharges for almost all grades were rising in conjunction with that. Bookings at many of the welded tube mills throughout the first quarter of this year were near record highs, right? So you have the surge of demand. Right at that exact moment, the ATI workers decide to go on strike, right? By doing so, one, they picked a time where the industry was extremely vulnerable because demand was so high. And two, they picked a time where they'd have the best possible negotiating leverage with their current employers. Now in doing so, 
the whole welded domestic tubing market went into a state of shock. For the first couple of weeks, everything was fine. All of the major players were announcing that they had mitigation strategies in place. But over the next 20, 30 days, real chaos started to ensue. The mills started blowing through all of their open raw material. They started realizing they weren't going to be able to replenish and create new products on behalf of the distribution market and end use market. And subsequently, they had to announce a major change in both pricing and delivery policies. So in a truly unprecedented move, most of the welded tube market announced that they were moving to price and effect, meaning that there was no longer firm pricing for anything that they were quoting or you were ordering. And they pushed lead times out to 20 to 35 weeks X mil. So you had this massive shock where all of a sudden, where you uh, all of a sudden you had lead times jumping out from a consistent eight to 10 weeks to double or triple what it was before. And in context, if you think about this, most of the big buyers out here were sitting here buying based on weeks of inventory, not months of inventory. So the amount of available supply in the marketplace was already at a low level because the market had run efficiently for so many years. So what happens, right? Um, downstream, what happens is the same thing you see anywhere else. When there is uncertainty in a supply chain, buyers fly, flee to certainty, right? So inventory suddenly became gold. Everybody was looking to buy inventory because they were underwater on contracts, they were unable to fulfill requirements, and they had real concerns about the longevity of their supply pipeline coming in for welded. Man, I'd hate to be a buyer in that market, Justin. Um, so how did things develop from there? Well, I mean, it only got more interesting. Um, as you'd expect, right? As those buyers pounced on inventory, most of the distributors out in the United States saw unprecedented demand for welded tubing. Us personally, we were getting blown out of sizes left and right. Our other competitors and other market participants were reporting the same thing. People saw unprecedented levels of sales, and they basically were in a period of time where there was a, a, a rush, per se, on inventory. So just like any market, right, supply and demand took over and price adjustments started coming through. What ended up ultimately happening is we saw price increases as far as 60% as the value of welded tube inventory soared with this extreme demand and the uncertainty that many of the distributors and market participants had about their own stock replenishment programs. More importantly in this process, everybody learned something new, right? They learned that the US domestic supply chain was more vulnerable to a supply shock than many of us had anticipated, right? So like any other good procurement team in the US, everybody was forced to rethink their supply strategies and to rethink if the domestically dominated welded supply chain was the only option to serve this market. Gotcha. So with the market in a state of turmoil like that and supply security being perceived to be low, what was the next shoe to drop? So uh, in, in uncertain times, right? And when unexpected things happen, people look for alternatives. So if you think about it in terms of economics 101, right? People were looking for substitutes. So on the procurement side, people started looking towards import welded for the first time in a long time. And when I say that, yes, people have been using welded import for projects, but not predominantly for stock here in the United States, right? So due to the supply shortage, many people were forced to go overseas to explore unchartered territories or less qualified mills abroad. So basically, with the pricing environment rising for domestic so strong in the first half of the year, the gap between domestic and import had grown to nearly a decade wide, right? A decade high wide, I should say, right? Meaning that the value proposition for import material was at an all time high because the price discrepancy between import and domestic had the largest spread it had seen in almost 10 years. So to mitigate some of this supply risk, right? People went overseas, they started implementing dual sourcing strategies. Some of them were buying a combination of domestic and import. Some jumped off the wagon entirely and went with import. Through this process, we saw some clear winners emerge, right? 
India, China, South Korea, Vietnam, a lot of these low cost producing nations were able to capitalize on this supply shock and get orders booked with domestic distributors and end users at a rate that has been unseen in a long time. So why would they do this, right? Two re the same two reasons anybody else would. One, abroad lead times were 60 to 90 days, right? That allowed distributors to come back restock inventory for Q3 and Q4 of this year. And at the same time, just as I mentioned earlier, that value proposition was extremely strong because of the price disparity that existed between the import and the domestic at that time. Now, the next thing that happened, and this is all sort of a cascading effect, right? That's great. That solved what I call the mid to short term gap, but there was still a major inventory hole and a shortage in the short term and people had to make some other decisions. Geez, so import buying began to surge in response to this event, I suppose. And so what you're saying is, what else changed on the ground here as we saw the imports being bought? So it's a good question, right? So just again, coming back to that economics 101, we saw increased product substitution. So all of a sudden, many of the market participants, many of the masters out there, many of the distributors, saw a Q1 and Q2 surge in seamless import tubing, right? So right now in the state of the world as it currently is, import seamless Chinese tubing is the second lowest cost material compared to the domestic welded in the US market, right? So as the domestic welded ran out of stock, people switched to the closest price substitute. And for the first time in my history with this company, we saw a complete inversion of welded and seamless pricing meaning that for the first time, seamless became cheaper than welded. So again, law of supply and demand, basic economics. Over time, distributors adjusted their pricing and things came back to equilibrium. But at the same time, a lot of us and a lot of other market participants still experienced extremely strong demand through the first quarter due to people substituting welded. So I guess that gives a better understanding of the situation. Where are things heading from here? And um, what are the takeaways from some of the participants on the call? So key takeaways, right? Um, coming into, let, let's actually break it down to short-term and long-term, right? In the short run, around Q3 and Q4 of this year, we're gonna see the highest level of import welded tubing that we've seen in an extremely long time. There will be multiple distributors across the United States stocking this material. Some of that sourcing will be proven successful, meaning those mills will be qualified, they'll be added to AMLs, and they'll be able to compete in the US market long-term. Some of those procurement decisions that were made by some of the teams out there may be invalidated. Some of those mills will be scratched off the list and we'll see a refined welded import market as we get more information. With that, the secondary thing that we believe will occur in this market is that we'll merge into a two-tier pricing system. So right now, if we consider pricing at the mean here, at the current time, welded is right flat with it or trending downwards, right? Domestic is going the opposite direction, moving upwards at the same exact time. Those two forces competing against each other imply to us that we'll see a two-tier pricing system with import being valued at a lower price per foot obviously then the seam, excuse me, welded domestic, which will be at a higher price per foot. Last but not least, based on the backlogs that these mills have, the domestic welded mills, we expect that we're gonna see them close their order books for 2021. When I say that, we expect that they're going to honor all open existing orders, but it's gonna be hard for them to take in new orders for this fiscal year. Even if the ATI strike, let's say ended tomorrow, right? Realistically, you are 10 to 15, maybe even 20 weeks out before the backlog of orders at the welded tube mills can even be filled. So it's really at a point in time where it's unrealistic to expect that this problem will be solved this year and that things will go back to the status quo. If I zoom out a little bit and I take a look at a higher level, mid to long-term, there's gonna be some long-term consequences of this, right? End users are gonna qualify some of these lower cost import suppliers. They're gonna add them to their AMLs and they're gonna say, hey, look, this is good material. It's at a much more economical price. 
and they're going to keep those supply lines open so they can achieve longer cost savings or long-term cost savings, I should say. But with that said, this is the USA, right? Domestic mills should never be counted out for anything. These guys are great at what they do. We have some great thinkers here in the US. We have some great minds that are running these mills. So I expect things will stabilize towards Q1 or Q2 of 2022, and I'll never rule the USA out. I think we'll be back in a position of dominance in this market. And as those upstream uh, issues are resolved, you'll see the price gap between import and domestic narrow and the value proposition for importing welded to uh, forego with that as well. As far as inventory prices, right? Um, pricing will continue to rise in the market for the foreseeable future, especially on the domestic side. The import will rise too because the import welded mills are not dumb. They're gonna figure out what's going on and they're gonna start pricing accordingly. Geez, that's a pretty good takeaway on the uh, welded side of things. And I guess we're gonna to start to transition into the seamless side of things next, I suppose. Sure. So sure. What, what do you think the state of the union looks like within the seamless products? So uh, before I dive into this, I want to give you guys a, a little more narrow focus on the seamless side. So what I'm about to speak to, I'm really honing in on what we call seamless instrumentation, heat exchanger, boiler, or general service tubing. So we're going to kind of narrow the focus. Um, some of this will apply to A511 hollow bar, but really we're focusing on the general service side at the moment, right? So again, painting the, the, the picture of context here, right? You have the welded tube market going crazy. It's causing increased demand at that same exact moment for seamless import tubing. At the same time, right? Bubbling up below the surface, we have a massive import container shortage, right? Right now, if I'm looking at the New York to Shanghai lane specifically, right? Container prices have gone from $4,000 to $12,000 per container. So let's kind of extrapolate that a little bit. If I'm buying 10 containers at a time, eight months ago, my logistics costs were closer to $40,000, right? If I'm buying those same 10 containers right now, I'm paying upwards of $120,000 in pure logistics costs. That's causing increased pricing to the United States for almost all products, not just stainless steel, but everything around the world. It's a big inflation driver and it's a big component of the cost of a lot of material. But more importantly, it's not so much the price that's causing issues, it's delivery, right? Acquiring and dispatching containers out of APAC or out of Western Europe or Eastern Europe right now is a complete disaster, right? It's becoming increasingly unreliable Deliveries with the mills are pushing out 45 to 60 to even 100 plus days, not because they can't get the material produced, but they can't get the containers to get across the country. They have a shortage where they don't have the actual logistical means to ship this stuff. And it's causing havoc across not just the stainless supply chains, but supply chains across the world, right? So when you take those two factors, right, you have strong demand, you have unanticipated shortages, you have unreliable shipping, you start to see a bubble emerging of another supply shock on the seamless side. So everything there basically has been driving prices up for seamless import, especially Chinese, which is the market leader for the low cost supply in the United States. But things really started to hit a crescendo around May 1st with a major regulatory change. So what, what kind of regulations did change and how did that contribute to the chaos? It's a good question, right? So the short answer is on three days notice, the Chinese, or I should say three days of public notice, the Chinese government removed a longstanding 13% export rebate. This had been an export incentive that had been in place for many, many years and that all of the mills in China have relied on. Now, keep in mind, China at this current time is the price leader in the world for import, import seamless tubing. So why did they do this, right? The short answer is COVID. Um, just like all of us here in the United States, just like governments around the world, they're tr trying to stimulate their own economy and they're trying to protect capacity in targeted select industries. So for them, removing this export incentive was a way for them to protect their own local economy. So what did that really mean downstream? What was the impact, right? 
So what it meant is any order departing on a vessel in China after May 1st would be subject to this 13% increase. Again, everybody found this out on about three days of public notice. So in a market where prices were already climbing, overnight, we saw an increase of 10 to 15%, right? So if I look at that market specifically, meaning low cost, seamless import, stainless, right? We see prices year to date rising as far as 30 to 35%. And I'll be honest, I expect it to go significantly higher. At the same time, as I said, China has always been the low cost leader in this market segment. But now when you factor in everything, they have a 25% tariff for 232, a 7.5 for 301, and now this extra 13% rebate disappearing, the Chinese adders come to as high as 45.5%. And that is a major change and it's going to challenge procurement models for this type of tubing around the world. Justin, so if you're seeing China not being a sure thing in the short run, what would you suggest that procurement teams do for this? Well, it's tough to answer, right? Before I answer that, uh, it, it's important to kind of understand where the rest of the world's at with this. China is a player, but they're not the only player. If we look at Japan, the Japanese mills are, are largely booked. They have heavy demand from Asian customers. They're prioritizing domestic and APAC countries and APAC economies. And at the same time, there were some pretty large distributor orders issued from the US between Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year, where I'm kind of looking at taking Japan and scratching it off the table, at least for the foreseeable future. If we pivot over to Western Europe, they're not without their own problems, right? One of the largest tubing mills in Western Europe is enduring a strike of their own. And the few options that are left there are really great. However, their lead times are starting to extend as those mills are slowly getting booked. Now, Western Europe makes a great product. They have great quality, but if you're procuring on a price sensitive basis, they're never gonna win that battle. If I take a look at South Korea, they're coming along, right? They have some really good supply out there, but they're still struggling with their quota system. As many of you know, um, South Korea is exempt from section 232, but they have two quota systems. One is the import quota coming into the United States. The second is a secondary system within South Korea where the stainless industry has established quota for exporting products from certain mills. In addition, earlier this year, South Korea instituted new legislation which banned material from being exported that had non-domestic milk. So there was a period of time where South Korea was importing Chinese hollows and then selling out finished goods out of South Korea and the, the South Korean government didn't like that and they put an end to it. If we shift once more and we take a look at India, everybody's well aware they're battling a massive COVID surge out there, right? They're having a tough time getting workers in the factory. They're having a tough time getting material to the port and it's making a more challenging environment. Lead times for this type of tubing in India right now are almost 200 plus days X mil. So you're talking about 250 days approximately before you see a stick of material leaving India. So what's really happening? So despite all of those challenges, India, South Korea, Vietnam, in the short term at least, are emerging as the prime low cost solutions and procurement teams throughout our industry are beginning to pivot their sourcing and retest those waters to see if they can find mills of quality to be long-term partners with. Wow, that's a lot of information about the seamless tube market and again, the welded tube market. So maybe you can take some time and, and kind of wrap up the seamless tube market and kind of consult and give some takeaways about the seamless tube market. Fair enough, yeah, fair enough. All right, so again, on the, on the takeaway side, I'm gonna break it into two separate areas, short-term and mid to long-term. So in the short run, right, we expect to start seeing some of this Chinese alternative material, whether it be South Korean, Vietnamese or Indian, really hit stateside in Q4 of this year and Q1 of next year. During that time period, there'll be a vetting process. Just like we talked about on the welded side, some mills will emerge as winners, some will emerge as losers, as end users and as distributors qualify them throughout their supply chains. Stock prices in the interim will remain at a premium. Just as we said, that, that 
export rebate has expired. But more importantly, on our end, we are forecasting that there will be an additional 10% tax increase in China effective July 1. So I really want you to take a moment and think about that. So there is a potential catalyst on the horizon for July 1st where material coming out of Chinese stainless origin could go up another 10%. That will only further exacerbate the alternative sourcing that we're seeing in the market and push more market participants to explore low cost providers outside of China. Now, again, that has not been officially announced, but based on the research that we have in house, we believe that that is going to be the most probable outcome. If I zoom out, right, and I look at a longer time horizon, my short answer is just like I told you before, never count the USA out, don't count China out. The Chinese are extremely smart and the Chinese stainless industry always finds a way to get this done. Uh, it doesn't matter how many tariffs you throw at them, how many challenges, they will always find a way. So in the short run, they may be losers, right? In the mid to long run, I see that China will regain its dominance and they will begin to become the, the most dominant player again in seamless stainless import tubing. Again, I think uh, a long, a long lasting effect of all of this, some of these risk mitigation strategies that we're seeing in the short run are gonna cause a lot of the procurement teams out here to rethink some of the concentration risk they've had on the table. We've had extremely high concentration risk for low cost import seamless on China for a number of years. And people are seeing that when you have these macro level supply shocks, whether it be the one that occurred in welded or the one that's occurred in seamless, that not having redundancy in their supply chain can have some very negative effects on the bottom line. Finally, if conditions do persist, right, and China continues to prioritize stimulating its own domestic economy, you'll see Indian and South Korean material gain a larger foothold in this market. Some of which of that product is of a very high quality nature and uh, will likely be qualified by end users around. Well, okay, so the welded market, the seamless market, uh, how about wrapping it all together in uh, a couple of minutes here and conclude everything and put it all together? Final conclusions, right? Well, big takeaways from today, right? So one, over concentration in domestic tubing on the welded side and over concentration in seamless Chinese import tubing have exposed a lot of vulnerabilities in, the many, in many of the supply chains here in the United States. We figured out that we are heavily dependent on both of these. We figured out that not all of us had proper risk mitigation strategies in place and that the industry as a whole is learning from this. Two, as we talked about, lack of supply chain diversification has led to stockouts across the industry, right? Some of those are gonna be resolved in upcoming quarters, but at the same time, things are gonna be re-engineered in the meantime for some of these critical use applications. Also, what we see is that stock is gonna be continued to be valued at a huge premium here. And maybe huge is a bit of an exaggeration, but let's call it a premium. No matter what happens, the current tumultuous environment that we're seeing on the welded and the seamless side is putting an increased premium on all stock that's already stateside. And until the supply chain and all of these new entrants on both sides of the coin are vetted, we're not gonna see pricing come back and revert to the mean. So that's really my conclusions for today, right? Um, I hope you guys learned a little bit in the process. So from here, I just wanna to thank you guys for your time, right? If you guys wanna learn more about how we can help you mitigate supply risk, what I'd ask you to do is reach out to our sales manager, Alex Lima, right? I've put his contact information below. As a master distributor, our job is to do two things, one, absorb price risk to absorb inventory risk. Both of those will help bring your total procurement costs down and help increase supply security for your companies. At the same time, uh, please ask that you guys follow us on LinkedIn, whether it be myself or Jim, who has graciously hosted me today. And uh, I thank you all for your time. Justin, a couple of questions came in. Let me uh, fire it out to you and see, I think we kind of covered a little bit of it, but one question is how to import tariffs play into the pricing comparison? So it's a good question, right? Um, so broadly across the US right now, we have section 232 tariffs in play. In addition, in China, we have 301 and some of the other market forces that we've talked about today. 
If you asked me a year ago, I would tell you that market participants were achieving a high level of 232 exclusions and mitigating some of that risk, right? However, the exemption process is extremely arduous. And at the same time, it's coming under question and people are giving up on some of it. So right now, if you look at somebody like China, when you factor in everything going on, right, they're at 30% plus, 45 or even 55% plus, if you believe where we think things are going. South Korea is tariff free. India is at a 25% tariff. All of this is great news, right? Until this is eventually unwound, at which point there will be a large day of reckoning for many of the distributors out here, us included, who have stocked this material for years and years and will take a large unrealized loss on it. Okay, uh, similar question, I think, uh, among the tariffs, but also what do you see as the outlook for the 232s? So my personal opinion is the 232s will continue to exist for the foreseeable future, right? If I, if I zoom out, I think that deals will be made with certain NATO partners where they will be exempted from 232. The perfect example in this circumstance to me is uh, Japan, right? Japan is a NATO partner of ours. They're a DFARS compliant country. We have reciprocal defense agreements with them. And more likely than not, the Biden administration will negotiate to a position where Japan is able to have the 232 lifted from them. With that said, as I mentioned, China is the low cost market leader in all of this. China is a political football that nobody wants to touch. And I don't see anybody backing off the 232s on China specifically in, in the near future at all. Well, that's a pretty good answer. And again, bring out the crystal ball, but great, great analysis from that perspective. Um, I get, I've get i kind of wrapped up all the questions. Uh, again, I'll thank you for attending and, and uh, we'll be trying to do a few more of these. If anybody has any uh, comments or questions, I think all the information's up there. Justin's email, LinkedIn, my email, LinkedIn. Uh, Alex, again, run anything by Alex you need. And, this point, thank everybody for attending. Is there any more questions? I don't see anything coming in. So I guess we can kind of wrap it up. Beautiful. Well, thank you everybody for your time. Hopefully I gave you a little bit of perspective and you took home at least one thing from today that'll help you guys in your businesses. Um, as we said, we're really grateful for the opportunity to be able to let you feel and let you see where we think, where we think things are going in the next few months. So thanks again. Great, Justin. Thanks for your information. Take care. Have a great day, everybody.